Yeah. You can do what you like. Yeah, I'll just yeah, sit here. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so uh, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the series on aging and technology. Uh, we've had a bit of a delay, so I, I won't uh, I won't say too much. But today we have uh, John Levin speaking um, to us about uh, basically his the work that he's been doing on engaging citizens, um, and the topic the top title talk is called "Novel Efforts to Engage Citizens and Civil Society Representations in Decisions about Health Systems." So just a couple words. John is director of the uh, McMaster Health Forum, so he's he's here local to McMaster. Uh, when we can catch him when he's not traveling, and um, has a, an appointment in both clinical epidemiology and political science. So the, for those of you who haven't attended some of the talks before, they tend to be about 40 minutes, then we open open it up for questions. We have the room for an hour and a half, but it usually doesn't, uh, we usually don't need the full hour. Okay, thank Super. you. Super, thank you very much. Great. So this is gonna be very informal, don't hesitate to interrupt me. And this is a new area for us. So I'm going to talk about the areas that we've been working in and why this is new. So if you have other thoughts to us, for us about how we can do this better, we're very open to hearing. So I'm going to be talking about how to engage citizens in making decisions about health systems. Most of my colleagues on the other side of campus are focused on trying to work with what they would define as patients, trying to help them make more informed decisions about their care that they as individuals receive. But here we're trying to figure out how can we give voice to citizens in decisions about how the whole system's organized and how we try to get the right mix of programs, services, and drugs to the folks who need them. So when we talk that way, that means we're making decisions at many stages. So which issues get on the agenda? Why does the government choose to focus on diabetes or something else uh, to the relative neglect of other conditions? Uh, it also means engaging them in conversations about which policies are we going to so to what extent are we proactively supporting caregivers as absolutely instrumental to the well-being of many people living with dementia and other conditions? And it means implementing things well. So even when we aren't happy with the decision politicians make, uh, civil servants and other people and NGOs in the community can still make a big difference in trying to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of whatever gets decided. And the types of decisions that we're talking about are what we would call big picture governance arrangements. So who gets to make what types of decisions on what terms? So what are personal support workers allowed to do? Uh, what are hospitals allowed to do? What are community support agencies allowed to do? It also means financial arrangements. So are individuals facing financial disincentives to doing particular things? Are others, uh, are fundings, is funding flowing to NGOs in ways that are to good care, and it's also delivery arrangements. So those are questions about where care is provided. So is it provided in the community or in a hospital? Is it provided in a doctor's office or a community agency? And by whom is care provided? Personal support worker, doctor, caregiver, who else? So those are all the kind of big picture questions that we struggle with. How do you give citizens a meaningful voice in that? It's not questions about which program services and drugs are provided. So we know that's hugely important. Uh, lots of people struggling with how do you engage citizens in deciding uh, which drugs are provided and deciding which programs are going to be scaled up. But there aren't really many folks trying to figure out how to engage them meaningfully in these big questions about health systems. Those types of decisions that I've talked about, governance, financial, delivery arrangement decisions, are made by a lot of players. So of course, front and center are politicians and public servants. So they might be working in government, they might be working in a number of different government agencies. But the reality is they're also made by a lot of stakeholders in the system. So uh, central funding and delivery, uh, delivery groups are making big decisions. So we have a local health integration network that covers this region all the way down to Niagara that makes big decisions about how funding flows and therefore the nature of the care that people receive. If you're diagnosed with cancer in our system here in Ontario, you're suddenly shuffled over into a parallel system of cancer care, completely different and, and to some extent disconnected from the rest of the system. Hospitals make huge decisions that have an impact on patients and citizens. Community-based support agencies, professionals and professional associations, charities, NGOs, and so on. So those are the nature of the players who are making decisions. So when we talk about trying to figure out how do we give citizen voice, it's not just a voice in the decisions government makes, it's also a voice in the decisions made by all of these other players in the system. 
So at the McMaster Health Forum, we have, we for years, I guess before we began it, we for years were working with groups in countries around the world uh, to try and figure out how could we better support the use of evidence in decision making about health systems. And uh, WHO back you know, a decade ago <laughs> issued a statement through the World Health Assembly saying we needed to do a better job of using evidence in policy making about health related issues. And one of the things they did was set up evidence-informed policy networks in many countries. So we were the group that was tasked with working with these partners, helping them to experiment with new innovations, and trying to monitor and evaluate it in partnership with them to get a sense about what was working and, and how. So the five things that, or the four things, that we've ended up picking up from that experience in other countries and bringing to McMaster, uh, at the McMaster Health Forum, are one-stop shops. So we have a, a database called Health Systems Evidence. Every synthesis in the world about how do you organize care to get it to the people who need them. Every economic evaluation in the world on those topics. Many other types of evidence all sitting in one place. Linked to user-friendly summaries by groups in the world that try and say, what does this mean for policymakers? It functions in seven different languages, all the official WHO languages plus Portuguese. And that's been hugely helpful. You can walk into a Ministry of Health in Zambia, or you can walk into a professional association in Argentina, and you will see that they're routinely using health systems evidence. We also now run a rapid response service. So the government of Ontario, or any major stakeholder in the system, can phone us up and say, we'll give you three business days, or we'll give you 10 business days, or we'll give you 30 business days. Can you pull together the best available evidence in that time? We also, and this is kind of our signature program, we can mean stakeholder dialogue. So we bring together for a given issue, we have one coming up, for example, on May 6th, uh, March 6th, that will have the Deputy Minister of Health, top public servant from Ontario, uh, the head of Health Quality Ontario, the heads of the major professional associations, the head of a number of health charities coming together to talk about can we better support the use of guidelines in the system. So the evidence brief pulls together all the evidence that we have on a problem in the system, options for addressing it, and implementation consideration. So a, a single brief might draw on 20 studies, three different data sets, 20 systematic reviews on a range of different topics, and then the stakeholder dialogues uh, bring together this diverse array of actors to talk through the same thing, problem, options, implementation, but then what's different is we also talk about next steps for different constituents. So what should government do? What should the dogs do? What are we looking to the charities to consider? And the final thing that we do uh, is we do capacity building programs. So uh, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario has now had us train about 450 public servants within government to be able to far more efficiently and effectively find and use evidence to inform their work. And that's led to a dramatic increase in their capacity to do that kind of policy analytic work. So these are things that we originally learned from watching and experimenting with peers in, in low and middle income countries. We've now got it in a more institutionalized way, operating with the McMaster Health Forum. And we work with others who do that um, in a number of uh, other high income countries. But when we look at, I guess, maybe two years ago, when we looked at what we were doing, we, and we asked ourselves the question, what is the, there's many things that we could do better, but what's the biggest area where we feel like we're blowing it? And the answer was with citizen engagement. And the reason is, is that health systems evidence, even though we have up to eight groups in the world writing user-friendly summaries of evidence, they're written for policymakers, and they're hard for a citizen to understand what do they mean for them. Uh, our rapid response service isn't designed to meet the needs of citizens. It's designed to meet the needs of folks running large organizations and folks working in government. Our stakeholder dialogues include civil society representatives. So if we were tackling an, tackling an HIV-related issue, we would have folks there from the people, the, uh, people Living with AIDS Foundation. They would be there from the AIDS Committee of Toronto. If we were working in the area of Alzheimer's disease, we would have people from the Alzheimer's Society and so on. So they're there, but we often found ourselves thinking we effectively have professional citizens or professional patients. So when we have the person from the Canadian Diabetes Association, they're the same person that's at all of the other meetings because they're a really eloquent speaker 
and they try to bring the perspectives of multiple different individuals together, but they're male, they're not male, they're not female, they're from a particular income group, they're not from all income groups, they're from a particular ethnocultural group, they can't represent all ethnocultural groups. They have a particular take on the issue because of their experiences. And while it's hugely important to give them a seat at the table with all of the other players, we're not really tapping into a diverse array of citizens. Um, and then the capacity building that we do doesn't focus on citizens. It's much more focused on health system leaders. And we're starting to see now some other groups. There's an incredibly exciting initiative at the University of Montreal where they're now training 4,000 patient ambassadors in the system to be powerful voices for citizens in the ongoing evolution of the Quebec health system. So we, we're proud of what we've done. But we know we can do better. But the big area that we worried about was this imbalance, that we serve what some people would call the elites relatively well, and we don't give voice to the full uh, diverse array of citizens. So we've, we've, for now, we're experimenting with three things. And I'm, and I'm going to stop after each one to see if you think we can do these better, if you think we have our own blinders on about any of these. And then I'm going to stop at the end, where you can say, well, you've got these three, but you need to add these four if you actually really want to do this series. When we presented something like this uh, at, the, at Health Systems Global, a, a meeting that was in Cape Town a couple of weeks ago, we intentionally set up a panel with folks like me and with folks from civil society. So we had one of the top folks from the People's Health Movement, whose comment and this was what the conversation we were hoping to jumpstart. I didn't know how he would word it. I wasn't sure he would say it this way. But effectively, he said, I love your citizen panel programs, but I feel like you're co-opting society's voice. You're determining the terms under which their voice is being brought into the process. And that means that we need many other things. So great that you're doing this, but don't think that this solves anywhere near our biggest problem. So we're very open to feedback on what else needs to be done. But I'm going to run through each of the three of them, ask you after each one how we can do better, um, and then ask you uh, at the end what we should be adding to this list. And if you feel like we should be taking ones off the list, I'm happy to hear that. So the portal. Some of you will know uh, Suzanne Labarge, now the chancellor of the university. Before she became chancellor, she made a $10 million gift to uh, McMaster and uh, six million dollars went to an array of researchers through the university focused on optimal aging and, uh, and then the remainder of the funds went to the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal. Huge significant investment meant to be transformative. So when we sat down to do this we brought a number of teams together. Parminder Reyna who's worked in the aging field for a long time Anthony Levinson, who's very good with kind of interface, usability testing, and so on. And then the three of us at McMaster, the three teams, that sat on a lot of very important evidence for citizens. So Brian Haynes' group focused on evidence about more clinical questions, Maureen Dobbins with more public health questions, and us with more health system questions. But none of us had ever targeted citizens so I know what I need to do for policymakers, but I'm a novice when I think about how do we effectively present information to make it useful for citizens. So we began by trying to work through, well, what do we hear people saying are the challenges in accessing information that's easy to use? And, and we came up with four of them, and for each one we came up with a solution. So one frustration, too much scientific research coming out every day. You pick up the globe, you turn on CBC, bang, today you should drink wine, tomorrow, no, you shouldn't drink wine, today you should do this, tomorrow, no, you shouldn't do that. Um, it's often overhyped. On my side of campus is probably the worst by far at the university for hyping. So we have a media relations office whose goal is to get our scientists' research covered in the Globe and Mail and other places. Whether or not that research is ready for prime time, but if it's been shown to work in rats and we can get a journalist to put it in the newspaper, we are, uh, uh, at least some of my colleagues are thrilled. It can conflict with existing research. There might be 10 studies out there and you've got the different study that's an outlier, but it's never presented clearly in that way. 
and most of it is very, very difficult to understand for most of us if we're not working in a given area, let alone for people who aren't familiar with uh, health-related research at all. So that's one frustration, and I'll talk in a minute about how we produce evidence summaries to deal with that. The second thing is, we can try and get people to go to new resources, like our evidence summaries, but the reality is, we know they're going to other places right now. They're, they're watching Dr. Oz, uh, and Dr. Oz, as I'm sure won't be a surprise to you, is an unbelievably talented co communicator and entertainer. But the vast majority of what Dr. Oz is hyping has no basis in science. So what we wanted to do instead was deal with this frustration that the internet is full of free health resources, but it's hard to know which are worth a closer look. So do you go after the razzle-dazzle of Dr. Oz, or do you try and find the stuff that's both well done, but also more uh, substantive in what's behind it? So there I'll talk about our web resource rate. Third thing, scientific research often only partly answers one question among the many that I have. So here, a patient might have a particular question about a drug to treat Alzheimer's disease, and a particular source of scientific evidence might say, we know this about the drug, but they might have three other questions that they're grappling with related to that. So here, our solution, which I'll come to, are blog posts, trying to bring the science alive with stories to say, well, if that's your question, here's some of the science, but here's all the other stuff, some of which we don't know, some of which we know and we have some indicative suggestions, you might want to think about it in this way, but to tell it more in the form of a story and help them to realize the, the where we know things, where we don't, and to answer a broader array of questions. And then the final thing is that the frustration that we found was newspapers cover lots of stories, but the emphasis is usually on drama. What's the exciting new finding uh, or dramatic events with no mention of related scientific research and not the substance. So we wanted to try to make a link between the stuff that got covered in yesterday's globe with what the science shows. So we have a system now that at 9 o'clock every morning, a search is run of all of the print media across the country. Any stories related to optimal aging are pulled out. And we then, using Twitter, put out one tweet about the article and a second tweet about what the science says. So those were the frustrations. This is the jargon we've used for our solutions on the portal. Evidence summaries. So these are key messages from scientific research that's ready to be acted on. So the majority of science out there is really important theoretical contributions, methodological contributions, a first study in a new area, but it could be within a year, it's discounted. So let's just focus on the stuff where it seems like we're far enough along to be able to make pretty definitive statements, and let's put it in language that people can understand. The second thing are the web resource ratings. So these are evaluations that tell you whether free health resources on the internet are based on scientific research. So you can't even make it into the initial assessment if you're a company that's trying to sell a particular product or service. Um, and there's one other, I can't remember what the other one is. Once you're in, then we rate all of your product lines. So if we go to Dr. Oz's website, if he makes it past the first, we look at all of his videos, we look at all of his podcasts, we look at all of his uh, both audio and video, we look at anything that he does. He might have handouts, any number of things, and they all get rated according to explicit criteria. Blog posts, you would know well what those are. Here, the majority are about what the scientific research on a topic means for individuals, but we also, in future, will have some on why good science matters, so people become more aware of the need to be skeptical with the information that they're receiving. And then Mac Aging News is the tweets. So they usually go out in pairs. Well, and the only exception to that is sometimes we need two tweets to convey the science. So there'll be one on news. The word news appears. And then the explanation about the article. And then one or two that say evidence. And then you have uh, what we know from the evidence. So that was our effort to go from frustrations to very practical efforts to present information to people. It draws the content from three best-in-class one-stop shops. So some of you might know Vox. Vox is one of the new news behind the news um, sources in the United States. Vox wrote a, an article probably about three weeks ago 
essentially, if I were a citizen, what would the places I would go? And they listed only six databases in the world, and three of them were here at McMaster, and three of them are integrated into the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal. McMaster Plus for my health, questions about my individual care, health evidence, the more public health, how can we improve our health as a community or a society, and then our database, Health Systems Evidence, with the how can I get the most out of our system or how can I improve our system. So an example of the latter might be evidence about strategies that include a combination of education and ongoing support for caregivers can improve the care of people uh, living with dementia at home. So that's the title from an evidence summary that we've written based on evidence that's sitting in health systems evidence. So early days, uh, in terms of evaluative results, what we have so far are user testing. We did many, many waves of it before the official launch on October 1st. Uh, that drove a set of iterative enhancements, and now that we've pushed it a lot further and responded to that feedback, it's now showing strong appreciation for the portal's navigability and its four distinct types of content. But this is a work in progress, and we'll be publishing all of that user testing uh, information, at least hopefully getting a paper ready by the end of this calendar year. Uh, and registration spiked after our official launch at the beginning of the month, so 425 new registrants in these however many days we are into October 23 days. So, you know, not great when you think of all the citizens that are out there, but pretty amazing to go from nowhere to 425 in a very short period of time. So that's our very rudimentary evaluation results. And then for impact, and here, you know, we don't have good examples yet of individuals using it to make particular decisions, but in terms of uptake, uh, if you go to seniors.gc.ca, so the Government of Canada's Seniors Directorate, or whatever it's called, uh, portal, front and center on the home page, um, and also same thing with the CIHR Institute of Aging, and there's a big initiative here in the Hamilton community, the Tapestry Project, working with volunteers uh, to try and have a direct impact on the care being received by individuals living in the community. And they're planning to, and some staff uh, and volunteers are already using uh, the portal in their interactions with uh, citizens. So that's our first uh, effort. So here, and this is by no means, you know, you'll hear about others, there's many other things we can do. Any reactions to our efforts to put science into the hands of people in ways that they can understand, that are already being covered in the news media, that tell the story about it, but that also looks at where they're already going and gives them a sense of which stuff they might want to pay more or less attention based on the strength of the science behind it. I thought, and I, I think there might be some people who might have been better uh, positioned. Uh, my thought would immediately be yeah. about um, training these groups of older people, first yeah. of all, accessing them, sure. that training, and I think that's why, why I look to, to you two in particular um, as having mobilized um, larger groups of uh, older people around particular issues. So, so yeah, I think yeah. training. Yeah, sure. And, and, we're, we're, down. and right now we're just doing it at a very basic level, two, uh, two training uh, workshops that are being organized, and then it's the Tapestry Project's going to be another experiment with training, but we would love insights that you have about how to do this at scale. So is it the two of you that have? I would guess. <coughs> I know that the Hamilton Council has on Aging yeah. just made a note with the McMaster Optimal on our website. Um, we're actually working on a, a grant proposal um, to do uh, to train what we're co calling the peer connectors in That's the community. And so one of our thoughts was, you know, so we'd have a series of training sessions with yep. these peer connectors would be teaching them about how to access it might be Yep. So if you if we can help in any way, um, or if you have thoughts about other ways in, that's amazing. Yeah, well, we'll have to get the funding first. But it's yes, no, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it helps when you're writing grants. Uh, yeah. If if we can help in some way in the grant writing process, let us know. Okay. So that's a great suggestion. Any other thoughts about how we can help? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just thinking about Dr. Oz and what what makes him so effective in yeah. terms of providing this information. Yeah. And one of it is the just the entertainment value Absolutely. of that. And I was just yeah. wondering where you're 
where that's fitting. I mean, there's such a history of, of, of you know, pr providing health information in a way that, that really isn't compelling for people. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's been part of your, your thinking behind, it, behind any of this. Yeah, so we, we have three different scores that get aggregated into an overall score that determines where you rank on our web resource rater. So a big chunk of it, because of, of course, our, our collective interest is how much evidence is behind it. But then there's one piece about uh, kind of usability, which is starting to get at the, you know, how sticky is this? Are people going to go to it and find it to be helpful? And the third piece is a bit more opaque for citizens. It's the transparency. So it could be that, you know, you have a site where the science isn't great, but they're very open about, you know, why that is and so on. But I don't think we're doing a very good job with what we've called usability. So I think most of us know that Dr. Oz is wickedly talented when it comes to attracting attention and getting people focused on doing so. So we need to figure out, is there a way that we can score that better so we get more examples of ones that do that really well, but also are really good on the science side. And so, so far, we're very rudimentary in terms of how we're approaching that. Very open to thoughts about how we capture it. I think the thing that you know what frustrates many of us with Dr. Oz is he, he 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 dresses like a physician, and society very often assumes that docs are based in science. They don't question that part of it. But in fact, the man shouldn't be. He should be a bit more in a clown outfit. But he knows that the, that conveys something to people, and most of us don't think that it should convey that at any point for anybody. But anyway, it does convey a sense of you know credibility behind what it is that he's saying. There's also something about understanding where people are coming from and looking for health information. Yeah. And so I think yeah. of I think of some of the research around in communication studies around audience response or reader response work. You know, because I remember there was a radio show that was a kind of expose of, of, of Dr. Oz and yeah. he was saying, Well, you know, my role isn't so much providing information but kind of providing hope. Providing hope. Interesting. Providing hope, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so, I mean, I do think that people c come to yeah. health, they come to this optimal aging portal, not so much looking for information, but maybe looking for hope, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And so, but you were providing them information, but it might not resonate because that's, they're really not coming for information in the way that we understand it. Right. They're actually coming from, you know, for other kinds of things that yeah. they hope that information can provide, but Absolutely. it might not. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Well, my thought is that just in the vein of Dr. Oz, yeah. a big component of his approach yeah. is that it's cheap and very accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, easy to go to the drugstore and ask your druggist. Yeah. Does it really work? Absolutely. Sort of yeah. Okay. Good point. I'm just going to follow up with, uh, with something that James said. Is finding that concept that can help people, a concept or an idea, and. Um, when you you mentioned Quebec earlier, that's not surprising that they're kind of testing that out because I think where Quebec has been successful in even getting older people's groups to talk about things like social participation as a kind of policy concept, um, you have older people, people with disabilities, you know, somehow being able to, th that bridge was, was crossed, I guess, by community organizers or that sort of thing, but they somehow felt that that concept was meaningful enough to them. Yep to participate in Fantastic. these sorts. So it's James's yeah. idea of hope, or what is that? Fantastic. That concept. Yeah. Yeah. Great thoughts. Yes? Another thought I had, there's a project now, we're a little bit involved with it, the Health Council on Aging, but it's sort of the library and a group of seniors in Dundas, and they are piloting a project they call InfoWatch, I think, and they actually have like computers that are sort of set, set up in the library and the city seniors senior center or whatever, um, and they, they've got people there sort of helping um, others sort of access information, yeah. you know, through yeah, these info, through these portals or whatever, so yeah. it might be worth, you know, Absolutely. for example, putting up the optimal aging portal, and it, it, this is just a pilot, so yeah. the idea is if it works, it might go more sort of city -wide. Super. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. I, I, picking up on the idea of peer connectors uh -huh. in, in Margaret's project. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that a lot of the patient-related organizations like diabetes, Alzheimer's, have these elite patients. Right. Well, they might have a role, 
yes. in yeah, facilitating, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, creating openings to help other people trying to find out about diabetes. They would have credibility. Absolutely, fantastic. We, some of you were at the Thinking Ahead event where we had different people come in to kind of jar us out of our usual way of thinking. And one was that, I don't know if you were in the room at the time, that lovely woman who has this show on CBC Radio Spark or something like that in her name. But but talked about context, problem, options, implementation. They employ a graded entry format, so that means there's a page of take, up take home messages, so you can get a high level summary of it before you move into the detail. They're based on syntheses where possible. We use a systematic approach to try and find the evidence in the data. We don't make recommendations, because to go from saying, here's the evidence on a greater role for caregivers that takes the following form to thou shalt support caregivers in this these ways, that would require us imposing our values and preferences on other people to interpret that evidence and decide what it means. Instead, we just simply say this is what we know or what we don't know. The values and preferences need to come from the folks who are around the table. Uh, it includes the references for folks who want to know more. We send it out for merits review to at least one policymaker, at least one state. We try to pick what we call one or two canaries in the coal mine for the equity perspective. So we, we say early on in the process when we're doing key informant interviews, who are the groups that you'd be most worried about? Is it people living with multimorbidity? So two, three, four completely different health conditions. So not diabetes and diabetes related complications, but diabetes and HIV and high blood pressure very different things, and trying to juggle all of those is incredibly complex. Uh, we try and consider the quality of the evidence, and we try and consider applicability. There might be great stuff done in the United Kingdom, but our part of the health system that we're focused on works in such a fundamentally different way, we would conclude that evidence probably wouldn't be that helpful to us. So when, uh, for each brief, we ask people to evaluate the brief, both overall and in terms of particular design features. So the overall message from the first 29 briefs, I think we're up to 33 now, but overall rating extremely high. On a scale from one to seven, did it fail or succeed in achieving its objective? A very high rating of 6.3. Most of the individual design features rated very high. The ones that are in bold either have a rating slightly lower, so lower than six, or with a slightly wider confidence interval more than 1.1. So you'll see a few of them. Uh, people weren't sure that we had done as good a job as we needed to on some of them. But nevertheless, generally, very, very highly regarded as uh, a document that sets up the dialogue to be successful. The stakeholder dialogue features, you'll see the left similar, address a priority issue, work through deliberations about the problem and its causes, options, implementation, but the deliberation, unlike the brief, also discusses who could do what differently. And when we've worked with other low and middle income countries on these, they call them policy dialogues. In Canada, we've chosen to call them stakeholder dialogues to avoid everyone looking down the table at the Ministry of Health person expecting that all change has to come from government, whereas every player in the system, we usually say, is part of the problem and could be part of the solution. Uh, it's informed by a pre-circulated brief. We discuss all factors. So this is, a, at the end of the day, if it's big decisions, it's about politics. So we talk about institutional constraints, interest group pressure, values, uh, the strength of the economy, all, everything, not just the evidence. Based on all of the forces at play, what can we try to achieve? convenes those involved in and affected, aims for fair representation as a facilitator, follows the Chatham House rule, which means you can use anything you learn, we just ask you not to attribute it back to an individual, so people don't get worried that tomorrow in the Globe and Mail they're going to read a quote uh, of something that they said, and we don't aim for consensus. If, it, if we get agreement, fantastic, but even the deputy minister needs to go back to the ministry to talk to the minister and possibly to cabinet. Even the head of the medical association needs to go back to council. Even the executive director of Heart and Stroke needs to go back and talk to people. So we don't try to get them to sign on to any kind of consensus statement, but there are times where people force that and want to leave with consensus and do. 
also very highly rated overall, 6.3 on a scale from 1 to 7. All of the design features rated extremely highly. The only one that people have a bit of hesitation about is maybe not enough concreteness to the discussion about who can do what. Because at the end of the day, if all we do is sit around and talk about it, not very helpful. But if instead we make a convincing case that that group needs to do this, this one needs to do that, this one needs to do X and Y, then we're much more likely to get action. And then we also uh, use the theory of planned behavior to try and get at, do people leave with a strong intention to act? Is this so motivating that they leave and they say, I want to act on the type of information that we talked about in the dialogue? And you'll see very high overall ratings, again, on a scale from one to seven. Two of them, though, the theory of planned behavior talks about very often our intentions translate into actual action but it's conditioned by some other things around us. It's conditioned by the attitudes in our workplaces about the type of uh, action that we're talking about. It's influenced by the norms of the people with whom we work, and it's influenced by the control that we have to actually make decisions. The two that rate a little bit lower are those subjective norms and perceived behavioral control. So that last one in, in everyday language means I might leave that dialogue absolutely convinced that I need to shake up how the Alzheimer's Society deals with caregivers, but I get back there, and even though I'm the executive director, I still have to get the board on side, I still need to get the senior, the executive team on board, and I might not feel like I have control over all of that because so many other things are going on. So it leads to strong intentions to act, but the reality is we're in a complex system where people are working in complex environments and often don't feel that they can actually bring about the change. And we have seen this stuff have direct impact. So an example would be, we went from a phone call from an assistant deputy minister on one day to seven days later having done 28 key informant interviews, prepared the evidence brief, brought together 23 of the key players from around the province, wrote up the panel summary on a Tuesday, and then on the Friday, so seven weeks from the call, it went up to cabinet for decision in Ontario. So magic sometimes happens that we will get called in at the time when they're actually open to a direct, very tangible change. But there's other times where we're involved and we're just slightly pushing out the agenda or slightly moving forward a discussion further on to the decision. So those are our briefs and dialogues. Citizens have a voice there, but these are not your average everyday citizens. These are folks from heart and stroke. They're the, the patient that you always call in from the Canadian Diabetes Association. And we think they're important. Having volunteered for years at the AIDS Committee of Toronto, Fife House, and the HIV sector, those organizations deserve a voice at this table. And they do try to bring the diverse perspectives of people living with HIV to the table, but they can't do it all. So we're, we got part way with it, but we don't think it in any way captures the breadth of citizen experiences. So any reactions to this approach that gives what we might call elite patients or elite citizens a voice in these big conversations with all the other players that will be involved in making decisions? Uh, and we wouldn't be able to do this without the involvement of our of uh, Julie Abelson, who's been active in this field for a while, and now with, in, by partnering us with the forum, we can do it on a much bigger scale and in a more institutionalized way than she could do before. So citizen briefs play the same role as evidence briefs, but we place a huge emphasis on trying to make these system issues understandable to citizens. And we also try and highlight questions of particular salience for citizens. They provide a unique opportunity to uncover unique understandings of a problem. They sometimes we, th we think we've thought it all through, and suddenly they say, holy smokes, he completely missed the fact that X and Y are happening, which is making us a, in, in, in very hard for caregivers to do uh, what we would want to do. They spark insights about viable solutions that are aligned with their values and preferences, and one of the things that we've struggled with the most is we're trying to get people to what some people call informed judgment. So we can go out and do opinion polls. Your snap judgment, what can be done to improve the supports for caregivers. But giving citizens the information about all of the complexities of caregiving and the supports available to caregivers in our current system 
helping them to hear from multiple different perspectives and realize, wow, my approach, my experience as a caregiver is very different from yours, and it's very different from yours. And if we're going to have a viable way forward, we need to make sure we have ways to deal with all of these experiences. So the information plus the deliberations, we hope, gets them to inform judgments. But we also want to know what values underpin them. Why are they saying we should do X? Is it because of a value around fairness? Is it a value around solidarity? Is it a value around something else? So we've struggled the most with trying to capture the insights from the panels in ways that don't just tell you where citizens got to, but try to understand the values that are driving their selection of those ways forward. Um, we also try to identify context-specific implementation considerations. So we'd be very concrete about, well, in Hamilton, how would this play out? Or in Ontario, given the programs we have, how would it play out? And also, we hope it will facilitate and trigger action. Suddenly, instead of politicians talking in general terms about citizens wanting X, they now have something very precise, a group of citizens informed and having worked through a set of deliberations think these are the values that should drive our decision making in a particular area. Very similar features to our briefs, the ones that are a bit different. Uh, we have a merit review process now that includes citizens. We also explicitly identify questions for discussion and we try and write it in plain language. And I should say, we, for each citizen brief and panel on any issue, have a steering committee that drives it that has citizen representation. And then we have a citizen's advisory group that oversees our whole citizen program that gives us feedback on the overall direction of the program. But this is a third way citizens are involved in steering what they do by giving us feedback on the draft evidence. Uh, citizen panel features, uh, unlike for stakeholder dialogues, they're not talking about all the factors, so we don't expect citizens to weigh things like interest group pressure, that kind of stuff. Um, and we also don't talk about the Chatham House rule per se, we talk about being open and frank, uh, and we don't talk about consensus, we explicitly talk about finding common ground and differences, because these people are coming at it from very, very different perspectives. Uh, we have many more briefs now. This is just the first wave. Very high rating of the brief overall, six on a scale of one to seven. Most of the features rated very high. A couple of them, you know, some of the, the qualitative feedback is the most interesting. Uh, the, the qualitative feedback on merit review was, yeah, but I want to know, how, how did you change this? So you sent it to the citizen, but what did they say? And then did you act on what they told you? And how did you act on that? So they're in, they in very, very often want the transparency. They want to know that citizens' feedback made us change what we wrote. Um, the panels are unbelievably highly rated. You want to see, you want to feel motivated about life? Come and stand outside the citizen panel when it breaks up. Citizens leave that room absolutely charged up. And they often say, this was the most important day I have ever spent in terms of really grappling with an issue and trying to push it forward in a way that's going to make this a better community or a better province or a better country. It's really amazing. And some of our early wins um, have been that the one we did on end-of-life care and, and a separate one on palliative care directly fed into the OMA's end-of-life care strategy and the CMA's national dialogue on so any questions about the newest piece, which as I say at the bottom, early days in terms of whether these strategies, when used in combination, enhance in meaningful ways the voice of citizens in decision making about health systems. So we're, we'd like to think we've made a small step with these three, uh, but it could be there's six other things that would actually have a much bigger impact. So if you have thoughts about how we can improve the three we're doing, or if you have thoughts about what are we missing by this, so any final thoughts, James? I was just thinking about whether, like when I'm thinking about the kinds of knowledge mobilization activities that I'm in, involved in, one of the things that keeps coming up are, are you know, the use of visual tools as opposed to, yep. you know, like little YouTube videos and, and you know, engaging at that level, yeah. particularly around literacy. That's a 
we haven't uh -huh. even got there yet. It's not even on our radar screen, so it's a great suggestion. We, we're, you know, we're in that respect, we're kind of traditional and we, we're focused on print, uh -huh. and, you know, putting something that people can read, but that's fundamentally alienating for many people, and we're, of course, then losing some folks. Uh, and even for the folks who are willing to read, it might not be the best way to convey the information. It could be some very powerful videos that illustrate what it's actually like to be a caregiver living through some of these might be an even more powerful way to elicit the values that underpin what they think should be the way forward. So yeah, no, I do think it. We, we seem to be increasingly living in a, you know, visual rather yeah. than a print. Or, yeah. Or some sort of integrated model. Which I'm super. super. Yes. The format that Mike Evans uses for his yes. promotion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, showing the act of writing yeah. at the same time as he's presenting or whatever. Might be a way in the future for presenting the Super. results yep. of the Super. of the search on yep. aging issues or whatever, That's so that right. people could actually understand. Yep. Is one of the things that sh that slows down the rate with which the information is coming. Absolutely, and, and to that made me think of two things that are somewhat unrelated. But one is that we have Mike coming to speak at McMaster yeah. on Monday at seven o'clock. It'll be at McMaster Innovation Park. Three very engaging speaker. If you haven't seen him. And then we have a few other talks that are coming up, all about kind of citizen engagement stuff. So if you want to know more about them, it's on the McMaster Health Forum website. On Monday, we had the person who is the Minister of Health for Quebec for the last two years before he lost power in the last election. Uh, and Jean was talking about the need for long-term care insurance, and it was just a terrible turnout. So we, I don't know, we pulled every lever, uh, but clearly didn't position it well. So. Uh, if, if you're interested in the field of aging, uh, look at the forum website. There's a bunch of, I think, fascinating folks coming up. But on Monday is Mike, who's a great speaker and a local boy.